As Americans, we are taught from an early age to value the study of history as a vital part of our education and our identity as a nation. Study of the American West has been extensive. The number of books published is second only to those written about the Civil War. But within all those volumes, references to African Americans are extremely rare. Today, historians are rediscovering the contributions of African Americans, recognizing their impact as a people, and exploring race relations as they played out in the Wild West. In this five-part series, Professor Quintar Taylor focuses on African American history in terms of forming communities, combating racism, and changing social and political patterns in the development of the American West. The African American West is presented by the University of Washington's College of Arts and Sciences and the UW Alumni Association. Major funding for this program was provided by Macy's, continuing its long-term commitment to promoting black history by making this video series available to secondary schools throughout Washington State. Additional funding was provided by the University Bookstore and UW Medicine. This lecture will explore the urban West, which was home to the vast majority of blacks in Colorado, California, Utah, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. The campaigns they waged and the troubles they endured helped forge the contemporary African-American urban enclaves in all of the major cities of the West. Welcome to the third lecture in this wonderful series, The African-American West, 1528 to 2000. I'm Rusty Barcelo, Vice President and Vice Provost for Minority Affairs and Diversity at the University of Washington. As many of you know, this series is a story about collaboration. You know, it's because of the work of many individuals and organizations throughout the years that diversity has become a core value here at the University of Washington. Some of that work has taken place right here on campus with this rich leg legacy of student involvement. Students challenged the university to think differently about issues of representation, access, support, and curriculum, and found that their actions were supported also by many faculty and staff and community who joined them in advocating for change. This activism ultimately culminated in the creation of the Office of Minority Affairs. We owe a great deal to those leaders in our past, whether settlers, activists, or allies, in, dr in driving the inclusion of our voices to the larger public debate about diversity and social justice and the role of higher education in the community. I strongly believe then that we must build and support a community of scholars whose work focuses on diversity in all of its dimensions, race, ethnicity, class, gender, religion, sexual orientation, nation and nationhood building, disability and age and so forth, and in all disciplines, and, and through it take our university and our scholars' research to national prominence. I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker, to welcome our speaker and introduce him. In this series, we've been thrilled to be able to share in the nationally recognized work of Dr. Quintard Taylor. He has dedicated over 30 years to research and teaching in the field of African American history, specializing in African American history in the American West. Originally from Brownsville, Tennessee, Dr. Taylor received his BA degree from St. Augustine College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and his MA and PhD from the University of Minnesota, which makes him very special because I was also at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> he is the author of numerous publications, including The Forging of a Black Community, A History of Seattle Central District, 1870 through the Civil Rights Era. Dr. Taylor is a former recipient of a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship. His work has received several awards and was used as a basis for the public television series South by Northwest. He is also an associate of the American Historical Association, Western History Association, Urban History Association, and the Black Heritage Society of Washington State. He has served in several university capacities throughout his career, including as chair of the Department of History at the University of Oregon, and currently as a Dorothy and Scott Bullitt Professor of American History at the University of Washington. His national and international reputation has attracted many energetic and talented graduate students to the University of Washington, as well as requested his presence in a, he's, he's also re has requested his presence in areas throughout the world 
areas, striving to learn more about building multicultural communities. And he has been a wonderful colleague, and when we call upon him to work with students, he's always there for us, so he's also an important role model. And I might add, students continue to raise important questions about what we're doing on behalf of diversity. And I'm so proud that Quintard Taylor is with us to begin documenting that also for historical reference for the future. So please help me walk, welcome Quintard Taylor, Professor Taylor. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Rusty for that introduction. Uh, yes, we, we have a lot in common, including the University of Minnesota, although as she often remarks, she was there much later. I'm older. <laughs> um, I, I want to thank all of you for coming to this third lecture. You're the tough ones. You're sticking it out here, and I'm, I'm very proud of you. Uh, I, hope, I hope you are learning a great deal. I'm actually enjoying this. I know it's strange sometimes to think that one would enjoy this, but, but I'm having a lot of fun up here, and so I hope you are too. But I hope we're also engaged in a process of, of intellectual growth, especially when it comes to African Americans in the West. I want to come back to Rusty for a minute. Uh, she heads a, a, an amazing program, the Office of uh, Minority Affairs, and she has done a wonderful job, and I want to acknowledge that publicly. It's a difficult job. It's almost an impossible job, and very few have done it well. I, you know, many of you know my affiliation with Sam Kelly, who was the first vice president uh, for diversity years ago. And I think Rusty is doing the kind of job that Sam Kelly did. Sam opened up the doors, and Rusty is making sure that those doors stay open to a whole host of people of color on this campus. And so thank you, Rusty, for, you, for your work. Folks, we want to we want to shift gears. We we talked last time about cowboys. We talked about buffalo soldiers. We talked about homesteaders. I want to shift our focus to a discussion of the urban West tonight, and I want to try to talk about its significance. But I will give you a preview. From now on, from this point on, we're going to focus on urban people, because indeed, to a large extent, as you're going to see in this lecture. Uh, the experience of urbanites uh, in Seattle, in Los Angeles, and other cities across the West helped to determine and to shape the contemporary communities, uh, contemporary African American communities, and contemporary communities in general in which we all live. When we usually talk about African American history in the West, certainly we do discuss the Buffalo Soldiers, the Homesteaders, and the Cowboys. And yet I would argue that that focus ignores the lives of tens of thousands of black Westerners who moved to the cities of the region. They, as much as those homesteaders and cowboys and buffalo soldiers, face a difficult and challenging and often hostile environment, one that one could call, that I certainly call, the frontier. But in this case, it was the urban frontier. 19th century black urban communities expanded in large cities and small towns. We don't usually think of the, of the contrast between uh, those cities or among those cities, uh, but let me talk for a minute about the kinds of places that African Americans would reside in. You don't see it reflected on the uh, chart up here because I've listed just the largest cities, but black urbanites made their way, of course, to San Francisco, as one might expect, but they also made their way to Helena, Montana. They resided in Denver, Colorado, but they also resided in Dodge City, Kansas. They came to Portland, but they also came to Poc Pocatello. And indeed, in each of those communities, they attempted to establish or fashion a life of their own, a life where their ideas, their views, their worldview would be respected and promoted. Indeed, I want to share with you something that's not generally well known. African Americans in Colorado, California, Utah, Montana, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and Nevada were overwhelmingly urban from the very beginning. In other words, when we talk about people in rural areas uh, in the West, we essentially are talking about Texas and, to a lesser extent, Kansas and the Indian Territory in Oklahoma. When we talk about the rest of the West, we're almost invariably talking about urbanites. We're talking about people who settled in, in, in cities. These 19th century urbanites were influential far beyond their numbers as the organizations and institutions they created, the values they shared, the goals they sought through politics and civil rights influenced successive generations well into the 20th century. If we look at the black West today, 
In other words, if we look at the populations of black Westerners today, we'll see that those populations are the result or the consequences of those migrations to the cities as opposed to those migrations to the rural areas across, uh, across the West. As late as 1910, the combined African-American population of the five largest Western cities, and I have them uh, on the chart there, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Denver, and Portland, totaled only 18,000. In other words, these are relatively small communities. Uh, here's five points, Denver's African-American community in 1895. This was slightly more than one-fifth, in other words, the 18,000 in all those black cities, in the West was slightly more than one-fifth the black population of Washington, D.C. at the time, the city with the largest African-American community. In other words, there were relatively small black populations in these Western uh, communities. But I would argue that such small numbers did not prevent Western urban blacks from organizing a rich social and cultural life or from summoning, as we'll find out, their collective energies to battle for racial justice, even in this region. Most people don't think of Helena Montana as having an African-American community. And yet, Helena had one of the most vibrant communities in the Pacific Northwest. To put it in perspective, guys, in 1890, in percentage terms, the largest black community in the Pacific Northwest was in Helena. Not in Seattle, not in Spokane, not in the, the various other places. There were, larger, there were larger populations in those other cities, but the largest percentage was in Helena, Montana. And of course, this brings up the fact that we also, and I don't know if we have time to talk about it tonight, we also need to note that black communities also decline. In other words, there are black communities that continue to grow over, over the decades, but there are some black communities that faded from existence, and, and Helena's black community uh, is one of them. Uh, we're going to examine tonight, not Helena per se, but the African American population in two of the largest cities of the West, Seattle and Los Angeles, to get an idea of how African Americans live. But before we do that, I want to provide you with an overview of all of those communities. We want to look at all of the communities in the West, because to a large extent, those communities shared certain characteristics. First, black West, or excuse me, first, blacks in Western cities perform surprisingly similar work. Both males and females were personal servants. Well, these are photographs from various places. I'll do these quickly. The photograph in the upper left corner is of Seattle. Uh, the, the one in the right corner is Seattle, a maid in Seattle, and waiter is in Portland. If you were to look at the entire West, if you were to look at the job structure for blacks in the entire West, you would see essentially that structure. Black folks are doing essentially the same thing. Women were overwhelmingly maids. Men were, they had a variety of occupations, but these were all what one would consider menial occupations. That is, they worked as hotel waiters, they worked as railroad porters, they were messengers, they were cooks, they were janitors. A small number of black men and women, the, the middle class as it were, uh, were independent entrepreneurs, and I'll talk about a couple of those people later on in this lecture. Those were the people who operated barbershops, or restaurants, or boarding houses, and they made a bit of money, and they often exerted a kind of leadership over the African American community. In the seaport cities, African Americans uh, were going to be sailors. That was one of the major occupations in San Francisco, in Portland, in Seattle, in San Diego. All of these, oh, I should say, none of these occupations paid very well. These were occupations that, that in effect, forced African Americans to live on what I call the periphery of the economy. In other words, for the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, blacks remained poor throughout this entire period. Despite their, their small numbers, despite their poverty, black Western urban, uh, urbanites established churches, they established fraternal organizations, uh, they established social clubs, newspapers, literary societies, indeed a whole host of organizations that reflected their ability to, as I said before, carve out lives for themselves. These institutions and organizations address the spiritual, educational, social, and cultural needs of the local inhabitants. But I would argue something else. These race organizations, and this is, this is the term that they use, that people from the period used at the time, these race organizations also provided African Americans with a respite from a hostile world, a retreat where blacks could gain some control over their lives. Listen to the words of the San Francisco Appeal, which is the oldest black newspaper in San Francisco. 
This is, these are words that were written and directed to its readers in 1862. We call on you, we call on you to create political, religious, and moral institutions wherever there are half a dozen colored people. We call on you to create political, religious, and moral institutions wherever there are half a dozen colored people. Forty years later, and then this is one example of the, the creation of these kinds of organizations, uh, 40 years later in 1907, the Montana Plain Dealer, another black newspaper, in this instance in Helena, Montana, declared, the greatest hope for the ultimate solution of the problems of our race is our ability to get together. And we are glad that even in this section of the country, meaning Montana, with a scattering of population of our people, that they are abreast in their efforts to solidify their interests. In other words, that black people, even in Helena, Montana, are connecting with the larger struggles that are taking place all around, all around the nation. But just as, just as important as creating these institutions, these organizations within the communities, was the need to link these communities across the state and region. Indeed, I argue that black Western communities, precisely because they were small and isolated, or they, they sensed that they were relatively small and isolated, needed such organizations even more than their Eastern counterparts. These organizations, these organizations that stretched across state lines and stretched across uh, you know, regional boundaries, reminded black folks that no matter how remote African American populations might appear to be in places like Spokane or Salt Lake City, or Albuquerque, or Cheyenne, that they were in fact part of a much larger community that stretched across the West and ultimately that encompassed the entire nation. Let me give you an example, and this is a local example. This is the Puget Sound African Methodist Episcopal Church Conference in Seattle in 1900. The Puget Sound Conference stretched from Oregon all the way to Alaska. Yes, there were small AME churches in Alaska. There were small AME churches that belonged to this conference in British Columbia. There were certainly a number of small churches throughout Western Washington, and there were the churches in Oregon. These churches, when I say small, these churches sometimes numbered no more than 50 to 75 members. But they, but they saw themselves as part of a larger network of churches. They saw themselves as a body or a community of faith. And essentially, they interacted with each other. And in the process of doing so, people coming down from Alaska, coming down from British Columbia, coming up from Oregon to Seattle to these conferences. In the process of doing so, they kept alive the sense of African American culture and their sense of their, if you will, their part of a much larger black world that existed beyond the Pacific Northwest. Or let me give you another example from a slightly different area of the Pacific Northwest, the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. This is a meeting in Butte, Montana in 1924. What is amazing to me, at least, is the fact that the colored women's clubs existed in every single state in the West. Even in, there was an organization even in Wyoming. <laughs> there was an organization of colored women's clubs uh, even in Utah even in Nevada, and on and on and on. In other words, black women, wherever they were, tended to organize. And these weren't simply sewing circles, folks. Let's be very clear on this. These weren't simply black women getting together to talk about, uh, to talk about uh, the latest social issues. The black club, the black women's club that formed in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1896, formed in direct response to a lynching. In other words, these black women organized themselves to deal with the racial oppression that was going on within, within their, back, uh, their backyard. But they also organized themselves to deal with, with uh, other issues as well. Let me take a minute, uh, bear with me for a minute. I want to talk about the Dorcas Charity Club. The Dorcas Charity Club is a club that formed in Seattle in the first decade of the 20th century. It was founded by a, a number of black women, and it was founded for a special need. There were two orphans uh, who had essentially been denied entrance into the state orphanage. And the, the, the director of the orphanage came to uh, a number of prominent black women in Seattle and said, can you do something? And these black women responded. They responded by creating the club, by raising money, and eventually placing these orphans in a home. And they were successful at this, and as a result of their success, they began to do this on a continuous basis. In other words, these were black women organizing to meet the needs of the community. Whether it's in Seattle, whether it's in Butte, Montana, whether it's in, in uh, Yuma, Arizona, they are all about the same thing, trying to create community, creating community 
doesn't simply mean people interacting with each other. It means creating, if you will, a helpful and supportive environment in the midst of, in some instances, great hostility. Thirdly, and I want to get to this, I want to talk about this in a minute, but I, I want you to focus on it as I talk about it. Uh, there were protest organizations that were created by black Western urbanites. These protest organizations often strengthened the bonds of community. Protest organizations, as you'll see as I talk about this, these images in a minute, protest organizations were necessary even in the West. In other words, there was racial violence even in the West. We think about racial violence as a Southern phenomenon. We think about the fact that there were lynchings in the South. We think about the fact that there were burnings of blacks in the South. These are two incidents that happened. One, in one case, on, on the right, the literally the, the Tulsa race riot of 1921, where an entire black community was destroyed. I won't get into the detail now. We can talk about this a little bit more in the question and answer session. But it was a situation where, for the first time, there was not for the first time that there was a race riot. There had been race riots before. But it seemed for the first time there was state involvement in the race riot. Uh, and there were new and, if you will, more dangerous uh, technology that was going to be brought to bear. For instance, machine guns were going to be used against the African Americans in their communities. And, and strangely, bombs were going to be dropped from planes onto, those commu onto the community in Tulsa. This was a conscious attempt a conscious attempt to destroy the Tulsa community. Uh, there were a number of blacks who died. We don't know, even to this day, how many people died. But we do know that a community was destroyed, and it would take years for that community to come back. Let me talk about the image on the left. It, again, it's very, very powerful. I apologize if it's disturbing, but I think you need to see it. This, this is an incident. This was the so-called Omaha courthouse lynching and riot. In 1919, this man was burned alive. He was accused of rape. Whether he was innocent or guilty is, is not the point. We don't know. We really don't know. But we know that a mob uh, became incensed at the fact that he was in the jail and he had not been brought to trial. And they literally destroyed the courthouse in Omaha to get at this guy. They, they literally destroyed a building, a building that had been paid by their own taxes uh, to, to, to kill this guy. Uh, I, again, I won't get into the gory details. I don't I, I want to spare you that. But what is, I think what is so depressing about this is that more people saw or witnessed this lynching than any other in recorded history. At least 8,000 people witnessed this lynching. This is Omaha, Nebraska. This is not the Deep South. This is, let me, be, let me emphasize this, this is not the Deep South. In other, in other words, racial violence could rain down on black people even in the West. Now, in some areas of the West, there's a little bit more ambiguity. As one historian said in San Francisco, uh, black folks always live with not knowing whether or not there was going to be anti-black uh, prejudice and anti-black violence. In some instances, they didn't encounter very much. In other instances, they did. And so blacks in San Francisco were always unsure. And I think that, that holds true in other areas as well. But the very existence of violence like this, the very fact that violence like this was going on even in the West, made it necessary, I believe, for civil rights organizations, for what I call racial defense organizations, to be born even in the West. In the 1890s, the major organization of its type, racial defense organization, was the Afro-American League. And it formed in San Francisco. It set up a chapter in Seattle. There were chapters in Los Angeles and Denver and other major cities. But by the early 20th century, the major organization of racial defense was going to be the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. Uh, let me turn to the next slide. W.E.B. Du Bois, as many of you in this room already know, was instrumental in the creation of the NAACP uh, nationally. And by 1913, he was in the West. He toured Seattle. And I'll come back to talk about his visit to Seattle in a minute. But Du Bois is actually the gentleman just to the right of the guy at the farthest end, the farthest left of that photograph. Du Bois is, is, is being toured, literally taken around on a tour by the prominent blacks in Los Angeles. And of course, as a consequence of that visit, the NAACP is going to be launched uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, that's not the first NAACP in the West, however. The first chapter begins in Houston in 1910. 
Seattle's chapter actually predates the one in Los Angeles. It begins in 1913. And both Portland and Los Angeles have chapters by 1914. I, 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 let me make an aside here about the NAACP because it's a very interesting organization, especially at that time. Uh, the NAACP, and this next slide sort of reflects this, the NAACP was one of the few organizations in any community that had a significant involvement of women. And indeed, in some instances, the NAACP leadership were concerned about the large numbers of women that were involved. In some instances, they were concerned about the large number of men that were involved. In certain chapters, they were concerned about the large number of whites that were involved. Portland's chapter was almost all white. In Seattle, they were concerned about the fact that the chapter was almost all black. And the NAACP national leadership said, if we are committed to an integrated society, we better be committed to integrating our own organization. And so they integrated the NAACP both on gender terms and also on racial terms in each of, the, in each of these communities that, uh, that I named. In other words, the NAACP, at least at that time, was going to try to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. They were going to try to create an organization that reflected the future of, of, of America. And this is, this is a slide that shows the executive board of the NAACP in Los Angeles in 1923, over half of the members of women. This was extremely unusual for organizations of this type at the time. By 1925, the NAACP chapters existed in a variety of places in the West, and I'll show you a list in a minute, such as Topeka, Kansas, Boise, Idaho, and my favorite place, Yuma, Arizona. In other words, the NAACP was spreading across the West and was spreading across the West in order to meet the challenge of racial violence and to an even larger extent, the challenge of racial discrimination. If we fast forward to the 1920s, we find that Western urban blacks were also joining the Universal Negro Improvement Association, or the UNIA, founded by Jamaican-born Marcus Garvey. For those of you who may not know, the UNIA would become, in the, by the mid-1920s, the largest black-led organization in the world. There would be approximately five million members, most of them in the United States, but also in almost all of the countries of Latin America, we don't think of Latin America as having black folks, but there, there were black folks there. In many of the countries in the Caribbean, and even in a few areas in Africa, even though the UNIA was, uh, was against the law, it was against the law to belong to the organization uh, in those areas. Let me, let me put up this, uh, this shot. Uh, this is Marcus Garvey. You see Marcus Garvey in the limousine. But look at the quotes from the Seattleites. Marcus Garvey came to Seattle at least twice in the early 1920s and uh, he had a marked influence on the small black community. And there were a number of blacks locally who became, who became Garveyites. By 1926, there were divisions or chapters uh, of, the NW, excuse me, of the UNIA in places like Los Angeles and Denver and Dallas and Seattle. But there were also chapters of the UNIA in small communities, places like Colorado Springs, Colorado, Coffeyville, Kansas, Mesa, Arizona, and Fresno, uh, California. In other words, again, the UNIA existed in places where we don't normally associate uh, with black folks. And maybe that's the whole point, that by creating branches of the UNIA in those small towns, those black folks were connecting to a much larger world. That's, that's what I think we ought to emphasize here, that African-American communities in the West were small. There's no question about that or relative to the Eastern communities, they were, they were small. They were even tiny, if you want to use that expression. But they were connected. They were never isolated. In other words, black people, even in Seattle, black people, even in Portland, black people, even in Boise, knew about the civil rights struggles that were going on nationally and, and internationally. For instance, in Seattle, black people uh, came to the AME Church, the first AME Church, which is still in existence today, as many of you know, and they heard W.E.B. Du Bois lecture. They came to the UNIA Hall in Seattle, and they heard Marcus Garvey lecture. They heard Mary McLeod Bethune. They heard Adam Clayton Powell. In other words, there wasn't a major or significant black political leader who didn't come through Seattle. And I suspect that that happened in most of the other fairly large cities. I won't say it happened in Boise, uh, but it happened in most of the other fairly large black communities across the country. Indeed, Du Bois would come to Seattle a number of times, as a matter of fact, <laughs> He would like uh, Seattle so much that he would take his third wife from Seattle. Her name was Shirley Graham. Actually, Shirley Graham graduated from Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, and then she came to Seattle 
uh, and became active in the community. And Du Bois apparently noticed her on one of the first trips out and continued to notice her. And eventually, eventually they were married. And I would say, and this is not a shameless plug for Shirley Graham Du Bois, but she was the most active, the most politically engaged of all of Du Bois' wives. And indeed, she would, toward the end of his life, become almost as prominent as he internationally. As a matter of fact, she died uh, in Beijing, China in 1976 uh, as part of this international effort to focus attention on, on race. So, so what we're talking about here is, is the African-American community, even in Seattle, being connected to these larger issues, these larger questions of, of racial oppression and how to deal with it, how to respond to it. Let me, let me shift our focus to, directly to Seattle and Los Angeles. And I do so partly because we're all in Seattle, but in, and partly because Los Angeles has the largest black urban community. But I also do so because in some ways, these communities are atypical and yet typical. I'm gonna talk about examples of their typicality, that is how they were like other African-American communities in the West, but we're also gonna talk about the exceptions. We're gonna talk about the ways in which these communities were different from those other areas as well. Let me go back to uh, 1913, the 1913 tour of Du Bois. Remember we said he toured the West Coast, he was in Los Angeles, he was in San Francisco, he started chapters of the NAACP there. He also came to the Pacific Northwest and he was especially, as you can see from this quote, he was especially, how will I say this, smitten by Seattle. He was impressed by what he saw in, in Seattle in terms of the political question. Um, I won't read the entire quote here, but look, at the, look toward the end. It says, you know, why are these black folks different out here? And it goes, above all, they are part of the greater group and they know it. Notice those words, greater, they are part of the greater group and they know. In other words, even though they're a small community in Seattle, they are connected. They sense that they are connected to the larger, the national and even international African-American community. But he also says something else. They want them to come, that is they want other African-Americans to come and define freedom as they have. They want other African-Americans to come to Seattle and find freedom as they have. We want to interrogate that notion of freedom for a minute. How accurate was it? Was, the, was Seattle the promised land? And I'm not gonna answer that question, but I'm gonna let you hear the information that we present, and you'll have to make a determination in your own mind as to whether or not Seattle would become that promised land, uh, and whether it represented a really different uh, course of history for African Americans. But let's talk about that history. Um, let me put this chart up. This is the growth of Seattle's black population. Now, I want you to watch this as I work my way through the early years of Seattle's black community. And I do so with some trepidation because Esther Hall Mumford is sitting somewhere in the audience and she is the expert on this period. And, and so I may defer to her on all the questions about, about this period. But let me, let me begin. Seattle's 19th century black population grew from a single resident, Manuel Lopes, the first barber, and notice I said the first barber, not the first black barber, who arrived in Seattle in 1858. In other words, when he arrived, he was the only barber in, in town. By 1900, there were 406 African Americans uh, in the city. By that time, these black pioneers had established or founded the institutions, many of which would continue to function in the city right to this day. For example, Jones Street AME Church is now the first AME Church. Jones Street was founded in 1886. It was founded before Washington became a state. Mount Zion Baptist Church was founded in 1894. And Mount Zion, of course, is still, still mightily in existence. Uh, it is one of the, both of these churches are some of the two of the leading churches in the community. African Americans also created businesses and civil rights organizations in Seattle. They laid the foundation for community institutions which would shape Seattle right to this day. Yet these newcomers entered a rapidly growing city. And I think we need to keep this in mind because when we talk about Seattle, we have to talk about a city that was changing dramatically from let's say 1865 to 1885 to 1905. For example, to give you the, the sense of the population, Seattle had only 3,000 residents in 1880. Seattle had only 3,000 residents in 1880. By 1910, 30 years later, not a very long time in terms of the history of a city, by 1910, it had almost a quarter of a million people. In other words, people were rushing in, people were coming in, and I would suggest as they came in, 
some of the frontier attitudes on race were going to be challenged. In other words, there were racial restrictions that were increasingly going to be set up. But we'll get, we'll get into that in a minute. For one brief moment, though, for one brief moment, it seemed the blacks had found a political promised land. Let me give you some examples. In the 1860s and 1870s, and even into the 1880s, blacks encountered very, very few restrictions when they came to Seattle. Black men had voted in the city since 1865 without restraint. And folks, it's very difficult to say that. I mean, there are only a handful of places in all of North America where black men were voting in 1865 without restraint. Black women gained the right to vote in 1883. It was taken away a little bit later on by, because it was taken away uh, from all women uh, by a Supreme Court decision. But nonetheless, suffrage rights were going to be far more advanced for women in the West, and particularly in Washington and elsewhere in the country. Unlike the South, African-American men, women, and children could sit on juries. That sounds like a small point, but it was a huge point. It was a huge consideration for many of those people who made their way out. And in the frontier city of the late 19th century, that is before Seattle became a big city, uh, in, that, in that small frontier city, which hugged the hills around Alaska Way, uh, black people could live in any area of the town they chose to. Black people could live in any area of the town that they chose to. And indeed, if you look at the census records and you look at the population distribution, blacks were all over Seattle. They were literally all over Seattle. Uh, black businesses were also spread all over Seattle. We would eventually come to a point where we would think about the ghettoization of businesses. In other words, most black businesses would be in a black business district in the middle of the black community. In the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, even into the 1890s, we see black businesses being established next to or interspersed among uh, the white businesses all over the city. For instance, uh, the, the largest black business in the city in the 1870s was Monet's, I love this term, uh, Monet's Oyster Saloon. <laughs> okay. uh, he sold a lot of other things, so he was a restauranteer. Uh, but what was interesting about Monet's Oyster Saloon was that it was literally across the street from Yesler Sawmill, which was the largest business in the city, and on and on and on. In other words, black businesses were located throughout the city because their clientele was located throughout the city. In other words, black businesses served the entire city, not just an African-American community. Uh, William Gross was part of this legacy. William Gross, uh, of course, arrived in 1860. He was from Washington, D.C. He became a leading restaurateur. You probably know the story of, of William Gross. Uh, what you probably don't know is that he established Our House, which became technically the first hotel in the city of Seattle. He also was responsible for helping a whole host of new immigrants, white, black, even Asian, to acculturate themselves uh, to the city, and you'll see an example of this uh, in a minute. Uh, Gross was part of that pioneer group, a pioneer group that had far more, if you will, liberty, far more freedom than would be the case in the 1910s and the 20s and the 1930s and, and beyond. As a matter of fact, let me, let me go to this next uh, uh, image. Robert Moran, uh, and many of you will probably not be familiar with Robert Moran, he was the, how will I say this? He was the Bill Gates of his era. He was the guy who essentially established the major shipbuilding facilities in Seattle uh, in the 1890s. But long before he did, he came, as you see from this, this overhead, he's telling his story, he came almost penniless to Seattle, and one of the first people that helped him, well, indeed, the first person that gave him a meal was Bill Gross. The first person who gave him a meal was Bill Gross. Washington territory was different, Seattle was different. It seemed, it seemed to a lot of folks that Seattle really was the promised land. It seemed to a lot of folks that Seattle was a place where one could be respected for his or her ability not and, and not condemned because of the color of their skin. Unlike California or Oregon or Montana or Idaho and all the southern states, Washington territory had absolutely no laws mandating segregation of any type. There were no laws, for instance, that mandated school segregation. And notice I, I said not just the southern states, but all the neighboring states, all of the states surrounding Washington had laws mandating school segregation. This is not just a southern phenomenon. It is a phenomenon that extends all across the country, and Washington was the exception at that time. In 1889, William Owen Bush, the son of George, uh, George Bush, 
uh, who was part of the first state legislature, and I think I may have made this point earlier, William Owen Bush introduced the first civil rights bill in the history of the state. Now, I think I also said that it wasn't always enforced, but the very fact that Washington in 1889 would embrace a civil rights bill or a civil rights act made it far different from the surrounding states or most of the other states. Indeed, black people recognized this. The first blacks who came, particularly in the 1870s and 1880s and in, into the 1890s, talked about Seattle being different. Robert O. Lee, the first African American admitted to the bar in Washington, arrived in Seattle in 1889 from Mississippi, and he declared when he came here that I had sought a place where race prejudice would not interfere with my prosperity. I think I've found it. I think I've found it. I, Israel Walker, a South Carolina native, said that he had come to Seattle in, in the 1890s to, quote, breathe its free air. In other words, that Seattle was different. Seattle was a place uh, where, where he could be free of racial restrictions. Horace Caden, however, summarizes the political freedom of Seattle, especially when he declared in 1900, and this is a long quote, and, and I don't have it on the board, so bear with me. We are the new frontier. These are Caden's words. We are the new frontier. And thousands of Negroes have come to this part of the country to stand up like men and compete with their white brothers. And then Caden said something else. We call on other blacks in the South to come to the Pacific Northwest to make one bold strike for freedom by coming to Seattle in the Northwest. To make one bold strike for freedom by coming to Seattle in the Northwest. In many ways, Horace Caden epitomized the joint ideals of freedom and success in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. And that, that prompts me to talk about the images up here. Uh, I've got two images. Uh, the first one, we, well, here we are, the Seattle Republican. This is actually from around 19, I think 1909. But it, it, it reflects Caden's almost boundless optimism about Seattle. His, he's a booster. He believes in Seattle, he believes in Seattle's future, and he believes it has a future that is free of racial prejudice or racial discrimination. And to some extent, uh, as I said, his own life reflects this. This is Horace Caden. Horace Caden is sitting behind the chair of the Washington Republican Party. This is a photograph that was taken in 1905. He's part of the inner circle. These are the men. And notice I said men here. <laughs> These are the men who run the Republican Party in Washington, and Horace Caden is part of that group. As a matter of fact, Horace Caden, uh, Caden's uh, newspaper, the Seattle Republican, proudly proclaimed itself, more importantly, as Republican than black. In other words, he was much more, much more uh, enamored of the fact that he represented the Republican Party and Republican politics, and indeed some of his prosperity came from that than the fact that he was an African-American with a, quote, black paper. As a matter of fact, I don't think he would have considered himself running a black paper at the time. Let me give you a bit of background on, on the Cadens because they are a remarkable family. Uh, Horace Caden was the son of a black Mississippi slave woman and a white planter. Caden was born in 1859. He attended Alcorn College. And fortunately for him, while he was going to the college, there was the president of the college, uh, the former US Senator Hiram Revels, the first black U.S. senator, uh, Caden decided that he was going to, you know, make a name for himself, and he decided to start dating one of the senator's daughters. He was not successful with the first one he dated, but he was successful with the youngest daughter, <laughs> Susie Revels Caden, as you can see here. She would eventually become uh, his wife, and of course, they would, they, and I want to emphasize this point, they would build a great life for themselves, a great business in, in terms of the Seattle Republican. Caden arrived first in Seattle in 1889. He worked for the Seattle PI, and then, uh, then five years later in 1894, he and Susie Rebels Caden began the Seattle Republican, which for one brief moment was the second largest newspaper in the city of Seattle in terms of circulation. Not the second largest black newspaper, the second largest newspaper after the PI in terms of, of, of circulation. This was remarkable. It didn't last long, but it was remarkable, and it was a testimony to the fact that Caden had, had sort of lived up to the ideas that he preached, the idea of, of sort of pitching in uh, and making a name for himself and, and, and essentially competing successfully with his white brethren. By 1900, Horace and Susie Caden had become the wealthiest, most prominent black couple in the Pacific Northwest. They could dine with the governor if they wanted to. They bought a house on Capitol Hill. You see only the porch here, but they bought a house on Capitol Hill by dint of their hard work and determination. 
From 1890 to 1910, the Cadens believed that race relations were improving in Seattle and the nation itself. Unfortunately, a reversal of fortune happened in 1910. Uh, essentially, Horace Caden, who was always a Mississippian, he always remembered his Mississippi past, Horace Caden got news that a black man was lynched near his hometown. And as a result, uh, he was incensed at this, and he ran a front page story of this lynching. This was something the Seattle Republican had never done before. They had always kept so-called racial news in the in insides of the paper uh, and political news on the front page. When Caden ran this ad, the subscription rates dropped off dramatically, and eventually the Cadens lost their home on Capitol Hill. They had to move into uh, a rooming house that they own. Uh, Susie Rebels Caden eventually had to go to work, and this woman, who was the daughter of a U.S. senator, the daughter of a U.S. senator, or a former U.S. senator, the daughter of a college president, a woman who had a college degree herself, this woman could find work in Seattle only as a maid. She did day work in Seattle because no one would hire her uh, to do anything else at that time because, because of her color. By 1914, Horace Caden Sr. Had, had joined the NAACP. Now, this is nothing short of remarkable because Caden would never have endorsed an organization like the NAACP in the 1890s or through most of the first decade of the 20th century. But by 1913, 1914, the situation had changed for him personally, and it had changed for a whole host of blacks in, uh, in Seattle. If Seattle's social and political climate seemed supportive of blacks, comparatively speaking, and notice I always say comparatively speaking, through 1910, the economic climate was never very supportive. Indeed, Maddie Vineyard Harris, and I want to put her, her statement on, on the board here. Maddie Vineyard Harris, uh, I think, spoke a truism about Seattle, uh, a truism that, hold, uh, that held for a very long time, and some argue that, that holds right to this day. You know, in the early history of Seattle, there wasn't an awful lot of prejudice, but there wasn't an awful lot of opportunities either. In other words, that's the crux that, that African Americans, I've said this before, African Americans remained on the periphery of the economy, even if they had, if you will, uh, social cachet, even if they had the opportunity to, uh, to interact socially and politically uh, with, uh, with non-blacks. In short, black women and black men found it difficult to obtain jobs other than as janitors, maids, waiters, and porters. We've already talked about Susie Rebels Caden. I think part of the reason, I think part of the reason for this was the stereotyping that had gone on throughout the country, a stereotyping that goes all the way back to the Civil War. Many upper class whites and even many middle class whites in Seattle and elsewhere believed that African Americans were fit only for menial jobs, that they were fit only for domestic servants. And, and indeed, uh, many of them thought that they were providing a, uh, or giving blacks, or providing a favor to blacks by hiring them in these capacities because otherwise blacks would not have any work at all. But I would also suggest to you that there is a strange pattern that evolved in Seattle that evolved throughout its history and that would get worse before it got better. Organized labor, or what was emerging as organized labor, which would be exceedingly powerful in Seattle, and which ironically, would be responsible for much of Seattle's liberal attitude and much of the, uh, the kind of uh, social service network that Seattle would have long before the rest of the country. Organized labor was exceedingly racist. They were anti-Asian, they were anti-black. And one of the ways in which to, to see this is to look at the host of organizations that had white uh, in their name. In the 1890s, for instance, the White Cooks and Waiters Union, the White Cooks and Waiters Union, refused to hire, or excuse me, refused to include anyone who wasn't white. In other words, Asians could not join the union, blacks could not join the union, Native Americans could not join the union, and on and on. And unfortunately, this created a, a, a situation that was fraught with tension. Employers knew that the white unions would not accept blacks, and as a result, they decided to use African Americans, among other groups, as strike breakers. And of course, once blacks became strike breakers, the racial tension intensified or increased between the two groups because now white workers saw black workers as being in direct opposition to them even though many of the white workers never took responsibility for the fact that they had excluded black workers from their organizations to begin with. In 1916, there was a major strike in, in, in Seattle along the, uh, along the docks, the Longshore Strike. Uh, 
This is a long quote. I'll let you work your way through it. Uh, all, the whole seaport, the whole port of Seattle shut down. The, 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 the companies were in a quandary as to what to do. Interestingly, they turned to college students at the University of Washington as strike breakers. Unfortunately, the college students couldn't hang, as the, as the kids say. They, they didn't last very long. And as a result, the employers turned to blacks from the South. They brought up 400 African Americans from New Orleans uh, to work as strike breakers. This was the largest single contention of blacks to ever arrive in the city at one time. And so that in and of itself uh, was, was, uh, was rent with, with tension. That, that development itself was going to generate a tremendous amount of tension. This is Horace Caden Jr. writing in his autobiography uh, about the strike and about the way in which the strike breakers were, were treated. You've seen this. I won't, I won't go through all of it. But this is not what we usually identify with Seattle. This is not the way in which we like to think of ourselves or our history. And yet this kind of racial violence, and this is what it is, this kind of racial violence uh, existed in Seattle as well. But I would suggest to you, even as you read that, the black workers retaliated in the face of such violence. As, as uh, at least three uh, people who were interviewed during the period reminded me and reminded others, uh, strike breakers got, uh, or excuse me, gave, and this is, these are their terms, strike breakers gave as good as they got. In other words, the strike breakers lashed out. One strike breaker was, was attacked by white strikers. Uh, he shot and killed one of the strikers. Uh, one other time, in one other instance, the strike breakers, tired of the, the, the kind of harassment that they had received at the hands of the strikers, went to the Union Hall, went to the Union Hall, the striking Union Hall, and they essentially chased everybody out of the hall. And on one hand, that probably made them feel very good. On the other hand, it just exacerbated the racial tension between the two groups. I would suggest to you that it really wasn't until the late 1930s that blacks and whites would work side by side, side by side on the docks in Seattle. And I would also suggest to you, I'm getting way ahead of myself now, it's not until the 1970s that most unions would be integrated in Seattle. And it's, what is this year? This is 2006, there are still unions that are overwhelmingly white in Seattle. In other words, there is still, there is still the attempt to try to exclude blacks and, and other works of, of color. If the situation for black men was difficult, the situation for black women was nothing short of dire. African American women had far fewer opportunities uh, to work. As I said before, they were mostly maids. Uh, they were either maids in private houses. If they were lucky, they were, they were maids in department stores. Uh, there are numerous examples of this. Let me give you one example. Irene Grayson, well, this is not Irene Grayson, but this is a, a representative photograph from the period. Irene Grayson worked as a maid from 1914 when she arrived in Seattle until 1950 when she retired. Let me repeat that. She worked as a maid from 1914 until 1950. And of course, she made a, a maid's wages throughout that time period. And this is what she said. I worked seven years during the 1920s without a vacation. I worked seven years without a, a vacation. And some weeks, I worked every Saturday and Sunday, as well as every day of the week, for $2.10 a day. Her situation is typical, or was typical, for a whole host of, of black women in Seattle throughout, throughout this time period. We've already talked about Susie Revels Caden. This woman was college educated, and yet the only job that she could find was as a maid. Let's talk about her daughter. Her daughter, Madge, went to the University of Washington. As a matter of fact, graduated from the University of Washington in 1924 with a degree in international business. What would a degree in international business do for someone now? <laughs> you know, that would be cutting edge. So that person with that kind of degree would have his or her uh, uh, future, uh, if you will, uh, sealed in the sense that they would probably be very, very prosperous. Unfortunately, despite the degree in international business from the University of Washington, Madge Caden could not find a job in the city except as a maid and ultimately, she was lucky in that she found the job as a, a waitress at a small restaurant uh, in, in, in downtown Seattle. In other words, blacks, and particularly black women, were excluded from the economic marketplace. They were excluded from the jobs that mattered. This concentration of black folks 
in these marginal occupations prompted the Northwest Enterprise, which was Seattle's black newspaper at the time, to declare bitterly in 1927, quote, in Seattle, colored men should have jobs as streetcar motormen and conductors. Black women should have jobs as telephone operators and stenographers, and on and on and on. We want jobs, jobs. After that, everything will come unto us. We want jobs. After that, everything will come unto us. Folks, I don't think they realize how prophetic uh, these words were. The, 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 the struggle for jobs, the struggle for employment would continue in Seattle, continue for blacks in Seattle well into the 1960s and beyond. In other words, this is not just the story in the 1920s or the 1930s. It's, a, it's ultimately the paradox of Seattle through most of the 20th century history. W.B. Du Bois never recognized that paradox. He never noticed that although blacks in the city enjoyed social and political freedoms that were almost unheard of in the rest of the country, they were nonetheless denied economic opportunity. And in that regard, their lives were very much like those of their counterparts throughout the rest of the country. Seattle proved a very strange racial paradise indeed. Despite, or perhaps because, of the harsh economic conditions, Seattle's black population decided to if you will, entertain itself. Maybe indeed it was engaged in an escapism, but in the process of engaging in this escapism through entertainment, they were going to create a musical scene that was unique on the West Coast. And remember what I said earlier, that in many respects, Seattle's situation was very much like that uh, for blacks in other areas of the West and other areas of the country. But in one very important respect, Seattle's jazz scene, Seattle would be different. Seattle would be almost unique. Um, Seattle's African-American population in 1920 was obviously small. We've talked about this. Less than 3,000 people. Moreover, Seattle was remote, if we can say this. Seattle was remote from the cities where jazz was becoming famous, places like New Orleans and Kansas City and Chicago and, of course, New York City. Yet this tiny community became part of a remarkably vibrant jazz scene that would last over three decades uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and into the 1940s. Here, literally hundreds of musicians, famous and not so famous, famous and barely known, came and went or stayed and influenced younger musicians, both native and migrant. Less than seven miles from where we stand right now uh, stood the great black and tan club. Uh, this is at the, uh, help me out, I think this is at the corner of 12th and Jackson. You guys, pro pro everybody in this room has probably passed 12th and Jackson. <laughs> you probably passed the Black and Tan. The Black and Tan was a remarkable club. I don't have time to get into it in a lot of detail here, but it was a remarkable club that hosted all of the greats, uh, local and national. For instance, in the 1920s, uh, it hosted Oscar Holden and Fats Waller. In the 1930s, Julian Henson and Louis Armstrong. In the 1940s, Al Pierre and Sarah Vaughn. In other words, these are the kinds of people that are, that are playing. But what makes the Black and Tan so interesting is that it was part of an a, a entertainment district that stretched all the way up Jackson, uh, Jackson Street. There were, at one time, um, and I think around 1939, there were over 27 clubs in a seven block radius along Jackson. That was an entertainment district, and it was an entertainment district that was unlike any of the others in, in, in the country. As Robert Wright said, as he recalled 30 years later, in 1935 and 1936, you could see as many white people on 12th and Jackson as midnight as you saw on 3rd and Union at midday. In other words, Jackson Street was rocking. Jackson Street was the place to be, and it was the place to be because of all these wonderful jazz musicians. Uh, let me go back to the Black and Tan Club. Essentially, I was talking about a black-owned establishment, although, ironically, it's in the basement of a Japanese uh, uh, store. And I think this is, this is very indicative of, of the way in which we need to talk about the interaction between those two, uh, two, two groups, the blacks and Asians. Indeed, from the 1920s on, black musicians played in numerous instances in venues that were owned or controlled by Chinese Americans. Not so much Japanese. There were a few Japanese American club owners, but mostly Chinese club owners. The China, Chinese Gardens, the China Castle, the Manila Dance Hall, despite this name was actually Chinese owned, and the Hong Kong Chinese Society Club were all venues for jazz played by black musicians. The Chinese Gardens owned by Charlie Louie was home to dozens of black jazz musicians from 1931 
until the time it closed in 1946. I don't know of any other place, certainly on the West Coast, and, and I can't imagine anywhere else in the country where we had that kind of phenomenon, where there were, there were black musicians who were playing to white audiences in clubs that were owned by the Chinese. Uh, <laughs> saxophonist Marshall Royal recalled, these were a different type of people in Seattle. He's talking about Seattle in the 1920s uh, and 1930s. These were a different type of people in Seattle. They were nice, they were cordial. I'm not just speaking of the black people, I'm talking about the Chinese guys. They were our buddies. I'm talking about the Chinese guys, they were our buddies. The connections with Asian American club owners in Seattle brought international opportunities as well. By the 1930s, musicians from black Seattle, uh, and those who had worked at the Black and Tan Club or the Chinese Gardens, began to play in Shanghai in ballrooms such as Casanova or St. Anne's Dance Hall. And I want to bring up, well, this is Tokawa uh, Hotel. This is where there, were, there was a club in the basement of this building. But more importantly, this is a building where a lot of black musicians stayed. They, when they were in Seattle, those who traveled, those who toured, they stayed in this building. And those who, some of them who lived in Seattle, stayed in this building as well. Uh, but I want to get to the next slide because it's nothing short of remarkable. Earl Whaley is not from Seattle and his band wasn't headquartered in Seattle, but he spent a lot of time here. But you see this slide, he's not here in Seattle, he's in Shanghai, China in 19, uh, 1937. Unfortunately for him, he's in Shanghai at the time the Japanese invade. <laughs> and as a result, his whole band is going to literally be put into Japanese concentration camps. And Whaley's, um, all of the fingers of both of his hands are going to be broken. Uh, other band members will die. Only a few of the band members will actually survive and come back to the United States. But the very, the, their very experience, their very story, suggests that there was, there was a remarkable situation for jazz musicians on the West Coast, and particularly in Seattle. We can talk about Louis Armstrong and where he toured. He never toured Shanghai. He never toured Hong Kong. He never toured Manila, as did black musicians uh, from Seattle uh, at that time. Indeed, Jackson Street had a remarkable run. For 30 years, it was the capital of jazz in the Pacific Northwest, and I would argue that it rivaled much larger Los Angeles as the capital of jazz throughout the entire West. The interaction between black jazz musicians and the Asian club owners speaks to the larger question of interaction between the two groups, that is, between African Americans and Asian Americans. As I said before, Jackson Street was a shared public space for a variety of groups of color, and this was extremely rare, exceedingly rare in the West, and unheard of, literally unheard of, anywhere else in the country. Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, and black all occupied that, that public space along Jackson. It was one of the few places in pre-World War II urban America where a black barber shop stood next to a Japanese grocery, which in turn bordered a Filipino social club. Shared space, however, did not automatically translate into shared experiences. First, there was the language and cultural barriers, and these barriers separated the groups from each other as much as they separated the Asian groups from, uh, from the African Americans. Moreover, we need to recall that there were class barriers as well. The Japanese tended to be much better educated and far wealthier, relatively speaking, uh, than their other uh, Asian groups, than their Asian counterparts. And certainly, they were much better off economically than African Americans. Finally, even if the groups experienced similar discrimination in housing and employment, and certainly the Japanese did uh, in Seattle in the 1920s and 1930s, they were, they were excluded from the unions, they were excluded from certain neighborhoods, and on and on. In other words, the pattern of discrimination was very similar to that of African Americans. Even if they experienced similar discrimination in housing and employment, they pursued radically different strategies in confronting it. James Sakamoto, a founder of the Japanese American Citizen League, the JACL, and by the way, the JACL became the uh, defense organization for the Japanese community. It became, in a way, the Japanese NAACP. The JACL was founded right here in Seattle. James Sakamoto repudiated the militancy of the Seattle NAACP. In other words, he compared the approach of the JACL with the NAACP. And he said the Japanese should follow another path. Quote, agitation begets agitation. And this can never lead to the best results. Uh, his fellow JACL founder, Saburo Kido, uh, said, or indeed, he was much more precise in his statement, we believe that complaints against race prejudice 
are not justified. They only show that something is lacking in the initiative or the ability of the one who complains, unquote. This is, these are powerful statements, and I, I don't mean to, to, to say that they are wrong. I mean to suggest that, that not every group of color recognizes discrimination, or maybe I should say that responds to discrimination in the same way. And we as historians need to understand the different responses. We need to understand uh, in a practical manner that, that people are going to call for different responses. As a matter of fact, James Sakamoto was called by his biographer the Booker T. Washington of Japanese America. And that's a very interesting term because Booker T. Washington is obviously not Japanese. In other words, there, there are black people who are calling for what would be known as an accommodationist strategy as well. And of course, there is gonna be an intense debate within the black community as to whether that, that would work. It worked for the Japanese for reasons that I won't go into now, but it worked for the Japanese in ways that it couldn't work for African Americans. But, but the fact remains that they took a different approach uh, from that of African Americans at the time. One Asian American group, the Filipinos, did join forces politically with Seattle's blacks during the 1930s. In 1935 and in 1937, the Filipino community of Seattle, which was actually a coalition, uh, it's not just the community in general, it's a coalition of various Filipino organizations. The Filipino Community of America joined with the Seattle NAACP and the recently formed Seattle Urban League in attempting to challenge the, uh, the efforts to pass an anti-interracial marriage bill. I, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but suffice to say that there were a number of people in Seattle in the mid-1930s who were concerned about the increasing frequency of interracial marriage. Not interracial marriage between blacks and whites, interracial marriage between Filipinos and whites. And as a consequence, uh, there was legislation that was introduced into, uh, into the state legislature in Olympia to try to block such marriages. The legislation was, was crafted and promoted by none other than Warren Magnuson, the, fu the future U.S. Senator. Uh, and of course, we all know that Magnuson later on would become a champion of civil rights. He would defend the very people that he's attacking at this point. But in 1935, Warren Magnuson was on the other side of this particular issue because he was concerned about the prospect of interracial marriage between Filipinos uh, and European Americans, particularly European American women. Uh, this coalition came together. Uh, it was not, wasn't just the blacks, it wasn't just the Filipinos. It also included the very liberal or the very left Washington Commonwealth Federation. It also included a number of progressive labor unions. Now I had said earlier that for the most part labor unions were racially exclusive. But there were a handful of, uh, of, of labor unions that were racially inclusive, and those labor unions supported uh, the efforts of, of the blacks and the Filipinos to block this bill. The, the upshot of all of this, to try to make a long story short, the upshot of all of this is that this coalition was successful in blocking those bills in 1935 and in 1937. And as such, they, they, they kept Seattle and kept Washington's distinction as one of only six states in the country that did not have a ban on interracial marriage. Let me repeat that. Washington was on one of only six states in the country that did not have a ban. California, Oregon, you know, Nevada, you name your western state. All of them had bans. Indeed, Seattle was the only state in the west that did not have this ban. And this coalition uh, prevented that ban from being, but from being introduced at that time. I argue that the workings of this coalition plus the fact that blacks and Asians lived in the same social space, plus the fact that you had a very interesting coming together of peoples around uh, jazz, all made for Seattle's experience to be different. Not maybe unique, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm ready to use the word unique, but certainly different from that of other African Americans in other areas of the West, and certainly African Americans in other areas of the country. I promise you LA, we have a few minutes left. Let me talk about LA. Let me at least get, get us started on LA. I probably won't finish it, but I want to introduce you to some ideas about the, the largest African-American urban community in the West. By 1910, Los Angeles, with an African-American population of 7,500, 7, had the largest black community west of Texas. Modern Los Angeles uh, begins with the land boom of the 1880s, which propelled the black population from 102 in 1880 to 1,200 10 years later, and of course you can see the figures, I won't go through all of this. That land boom affected everyone. In other words, a whole, a whole world rushed into Los Angeles. Los Angeles' entire population jumped from about 11,000 in 1880 
uh, to I think something like 70,000 10 years later. And between 1880 and 1920, I want you to, to mark these figures, between 1880 and 1920, Los Angeles population went from 11,000 to 1.2 million. From 11,000 to 1.2 million. And all, as all these people come in, they're buying land. And of course, the people who are lucky enough to be in LA before this rush are going to be very, very successful. And one of those people was none other than Bridget Biddy Mason. We talked about her earlier as that slave who gained her freedom in 1856 in Los Angeles. In 1866, she homesteaded land. There was urban homesteading as well. She homesteaded land in Los Angeles. And by 1872, she had become a pillar of the community. She was probably the wealthiest black woman in Los Angeles at that time. And she didn't have to do anything. She just had to hold on to the land, which became more and more valuable. As a matter of fact, her land was on the outskirts of Los Angeles when she homesteaded in 1866. By 1890, it was, on the, it was on the outskirts of downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> in other words, and of course it had become much, much more valuable. And, the, and to give you an idea of the place of Betty Mason's old homestead, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Los Angeles, but if you go there today and you go to the Ronald Reagan building, which is, <laughs> which is in downtown Los Angeles, and you go directly across the street, you'll be in a, in a complex, in a shopping complex, which is where Betty Mason's home, homestead once stood. In other words, this is very much part of downtown Los Angeles. One wonders what would have happened if the family had held on uh, up until this point, but they didn't. Uh, Mason established the first AME, or the first African Methodist Episcopal Church. When I say first, I, that's the name of the church, first AME Church, as you can see here. She founded it in 1872, and she paid all of the expenses, including the expense for the minister for over 20 years, in order to, quote, hold it for my people, uh, her word, although she continued to go to a predominantly white church. Mason's descendants, <laughs> Mason's descendants continued the profit from the growing value of Southern California real estate. Her son-in-law, Charles Owens, before his death in 1882, purchased valuable parcels around the, the homestead, and, and, and his grandson continued to do, uh, to do this, continued to build around that. And in, in 1905, he constructed a $250,000 building. Now, these are 1905 dollars, a $250,000 six-story story building on the edge of downtown Los Angeles, on the original site. Let me see if we have this, yeah. This is part of the, the Mason Owens business block. So the Mason Owens family became very, very prosperous. Unfortunately, that prosperity didn't extend to other Angelinos. Most of the newcomers who came to Los Angeles, especially the black newcomers, found employment as construction and repair workers for the Southern Pacific Railroad and the Santa Fe Railroad or they worked as cooks and porters and waiters and maids, the same old story. During the first decade of the 20th century, the black population of Los Angeles jumped to about 7,500 and it surpassed California's, excuse me, the Bay Area's population as the, and became the center of black population, uh, black, uh, the black uh, community in California. Early 20th century black Angelinos organized institutions and organizations, and in the interest of brevity, I'm not gonna list all of them. The most interesting of these organizations, though I, I do wanna talk about for a minute, it's the Los Angeles Forum. Now every time I say Los Angeles Forum, everybody thinks about where the Lakers used to play. This is not what I'm talking about. The Los Angeles Forum was an organization crafted by African Americans about the turn of the century, that is the beginning of the 20th century, and it was essentially, as the name suggests, a community forum. It was a place where people could come together to discuss issues affecting African America, especially uh, affecting the community. And the forum continued to operate in that fashion, even though it started in a very small black community, it continued to operate as the community grew right up until 1942. That is from 1900 until 1942, this was the premier political organization, not the NAACP, this was the premier political organization in Los Angeles. It was also the organization that started a whole host of scholarships or provided a whole host of scholarships for African-American women and men uh, who were growing up in Los Angeles. One woman who received the scholarship, Dr. Ruth Temple, became in 1910 the first female black physician on the West Coast. And she was, her medical school fees were paid by the forum. In other words, the forum was concerned with education. They were also concerned with community uplift. They were also concerned with dealing with the various problems uh, that were facing the African-American community. I, I want to name one other organization, the Sojourner Truth Industrial Club, which was established by black women in 1906. 
and it was established to, quote, establish a Christian dwelling that would be a safe refuge, unquote, for African-American women, single black women who were coming into the city. In other words, as black women came without husbands or without uh, accompanying of families, they could be exploited. And the, the, this Los Angeles club, the Sojourner Truth Industrial Club, uh, was there to try to take care of them as best they could. But in the process, the club organized in 1907 one of the first daycare facilities in, in Los Angeles, and we believe one of the first daycare facilities in the entire country. Um, Los Angeles would continue to grow. Let me give you some examples. Of, oh, this is the, the New Age. This is one of the newspapers in black Los Angeles. But this is the newspaper of note. This is the California Eagle. It was founded by a man, uh, James Nehemiah, in, in 1879. It continued to publish until 1966. And for the most, most of the years, it was edited by Charlotte Bass. Charlotte Bass is a remarkable woman. Again, we don't have time to talk about her. Uh, she went from being a conservative Republican to a member of the Progressive Party in 1952, and not just a member of the Progressive Party. She was actually the vice presidential candidate on the Progressive Party ticket in 1952. Thus, she has the distinction of being the first black woman nominated for a, uh, to a presidential party ticket in the history of the country. We think about Shirley Chisholm coming along a little bit later, but Charlotte Bass was much, much, much earlier. Black Los Angeles by the 1920s would not only continue to grow, it would explode. And as it exploded, it became, as one, one wag said, it became the Harlem of the West. It became literally the Harlem of the West. Black Los Angeles had Central Avenue, and Central Avenue uh, had a whole host of businesses, far more African-American businesses than anywhere else in the West. On the avenue could be found black-owned theaters, saving and loans associations, saving and loan associations, automobile dealerships, and of course, the Dunbar Hotel. The Dunbar Hotel was the largest, the most opulent black-owned hotel west of Chicago. It was made famous in 1928 when the NAACP met in Los Angeles for the first time west of the Mississippi River. The, the National Convention was west of the Mississippi River. They met precisely because they wanted to be in the Dunbar. And the Dunbar became the place for movie stars and celebrities, black movie stars and celebrities for, for a long, long time. Let me give you some other examples here. The Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, founded in 1924. Uh, Golden State is still around. It's not on Central Avenue anymore, but it's still around. It is the second largest black insurance company in the country today. In other words, it, it grew, it became prosperous, it is still prosperous in, in Los Angeles. Los Angeles uh, had in the 1920s along Central Avenue what I call a brief literary renaissance. I've tried to argue against the hordes and hordes of, of intellectuals from the East who argued that there was only one renaissance and it was in Harlem. I've tried to argue, and I haven't been successful so far, maybe you guys can carry the torch for me. Uh, <laughs> I've tried to argue that before Langston Hughes, before uh, uh, Arna Bontemps, and before Wallace Thurman ever made it to Harlem, they were in Los Angeles, and they were writing, and they were attempting to create a literary renaissance in Los Angeles with magazines, with books. They met at the public library just off Central Avenue. In other words, everything that they would do in Harlem after 1925 they did in Los Angeles in 1924, 1923, 1924, 1925. Wallace Thurman, for instance, was born in Salt Lake City, so he was clearly a Westerner. Arnold Bontemps uh, was born in Louisiana, but he spent most of his life in Watts. Uh, and, and of course, Langston Hughes, who was arguably the most famous of the Renaissance poets and writers, uh, came from Kansas, and on and on and on. In other words, there was a huge black Western input in the very famous uh, Renaissance uh, that took place, some people say that took place in Harlem. Sebastian's Cotton Club, I use this, I'm throwing this image up quickly, I use this to show that there were a host of black nightclubs all along uh, Central Avenue and elsewhere. Sebastian's was actually not on Central Avenue, but it was close enough to be considered part of, uh, part of this array of nightclubs. Now I will admit, these clubs were larger and more elaborate than the clubs in Seattle but I don't know if they had any better jazz. I don't, know. I don't know if the jazz was any better in these clubs than in Seattle. What they did have, unfortunately for Seattle, they did have the Hollywood stars. Humphrey Bogart, Clark Gable, Mae West would come to these clubs. 
They would hang out with black musicians. They would hang out with some of the, the blacks who attended these clubs. And they would, quote, make the scene or help make the scene for, for Los Angeles, for the Los Angeles jazz scene. I use that, I use the reference to Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart and Mae West as a kind of a, a segue into the next uh, discussion, and that's Hollywood's black royalty. For one brief moment, maybe more than a brief moment, because I think we can argue that it continues to this day, but in the beginning, Hollywood would see African Americans in, in roles. Now, some of these roles were problematic, as I'm going to explain in a minute, but they would see African Americans in roles in a whole host of Hollywood productions. And as a result, some black folks would do fairly well. As a matter of fact, there's one ironic statement uh, made by Louise Beavers. When someone criticized her for playing the role of a maid uh, in so many movies, she said, well, I'd much rather play a maid in Hollywood than be a maid in, re in real life. In other words, she made a great deal of money even, even playing a maid in Hollywood. Uh, here's another irony. African Americans, at least when the movie industry started and before it was located in Los Angeles, the movie industry sort of relocates or concentrates in Los Angeles in the second decade of the 20th century. But before the industry uh, located in Southern California and Los Angeles in the place we call Hollywood, it was scattered all over the country, and ironically, black people, for the most part, had non-stereotypical roles. One of the earliest movies that was made by any production company, uh, this was Thomas Edison's production company, was about the Buffalo Soldiers in the Spanish-American War, and it, it lauded their bravery. And this was the way the situation evolved up until, I, I would say, the first, eh, the second decade of the 20th century. And then as, as the industry concentrated in Los Angeles for reasons that I'm not sure I completely understand, those roles began to change. This is the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. This is one of the black-owned motion picture companies. It started in, in Omaha, Nebraska. It relocated uh, in California in 1916. It became the largest black-owned company, black-owned motion picture company at the time. Um, unfortunately, there weren't a lot of examples of the Lincoln uh, Company. There were other examples, and that's Step and Fetch It. Let me talk about Step and Fetch It, and because in many ways, he is an example, the, the quintessential example of the tragedy of Hollywood. Step and Fetch It was born Lincoln Theodore Monroe Andrew Perry. He was born in Florida, uh, and, and he's, he was in vaudeville for a while. He got his training in vaudeville, and eventually he made it to the West Coast. Unfortunately, he arrived in Hollywood at the time when most of the movie moguls had decided that black people ought to play what, they, what the movie moguls considered black people to do and be in real life. They ought to play maids and chauffeurs and butlers, but worse, they ought to play them in stereotype. In other words, they ought to, they ought to play them as Step and Fetch it would, as bumbling, shuffling, ignorant people. Indeed, Step and Fetch it would star in about 25 movies in a seven year period, and in each one of those movies, he would be what we would now call comic relief, but he would be the bumbling, shuffling, ignorant uh, black person. And that image is what would be projected on the screen in Hollywood across the country and ultimately around the world. Ironically, ironically, Step and Fetch it in real life was nothing like the character that he played in the movies. In real life, he was a demanding person. In real life, he was fantastically wealthy. He made a tremendous amount of money off of all of these movies, even though he played these stereotypical roles. He lived the high life. Unfortunately, he lived the high life too well because it's this kind of lifestyle that would ultimately bankrupt him. He spent more money than he took in. But, but unfortunately, he never understood that his role that his, or his responsibility in those roles that were being projected. Increasingly, the NAACP was critical of him and the black press, so much so that by 1937, 1938, uh, he ultimately lost those roles. And by 1939, he was bankrupt and he died in, uh, in poverty. And I won't say very much about Hattie McDaniel. You all know that she won the first uh, Oscar uh, long before Denzel Washington and Sidney Poitier and all the others. And she played the stereotypical role, but in some ways she played against the stereotype. In other words, she turned what would have been a stereotypical role into a much more assertive role. Oscar, the Oscar was a prestigious award, and it was nothing short of remarkable that this black woman would receive that award uh, in, in, uh, for her role in Gone with the Wind. Black Hollywood, throughout this period, never received what I would call 
the recognition for his real talents. Yes, there were some people like Lena Horne or Louis Armstrong who played in movies that were directed at black audiences that were non-stereotypical. Uh, there were these images that were projected, but these movies constituted no more than about 15 to 20 percent of the movies that were made about black folks or movies that had black people in them. And, if, and it wouldn't, and this situation wouldn't change until I would say the 1960s. Although with the black exploitation movies of the 1970s, some would argue that the situation actually got worse. Uh, black Hollywood is still problematic, folks, but it was certainly problematic at that, at that particular time. I wanna talk about one other phenomenon in Southern California. Black folks knew, most black folks knew that they wouldn't become Hollywood stars. They knew that they wouldn't become uh, wealthy media moguls and the like, but they could own real estate. Black people in Los Angeles uh, arrived in California at the time when real estate was accessible to almost everyone. Let me give you an example, and I think it's a remarkable example. In, on the Central Avenue, or in the Central Avenue District in 1925, one could buy a California cottage, a home like that, it's a modest home, for $900. One could pay as little as $100 down and $20 a month in, in house payments. This house, even today, would probably be worth half a million in Los Angeles. <laughs> but, but, but at that time, housing was cheap enough to be accessible, to be affordable. And it's not surprising then that Los Angeles blacks had the highest rate of home ownership in the country, in the country in 1940. As a, lot of, as a matter of fact, even though they didn't have economic opportunity, even those janitors praised the fact that they could, they could buy homes. And that made Los Angeles far different. But unfortunately, Los Angeles had an ugly Achilles heel. There is opportunity, but there's also challenge. You can see Sidney Dones. Sidney Dones is an African-American president of the California Realty Board. This is the Black Real Estate Association. And he's talking about uh, bringing blacks to California to, to enjoy the always sunshine and to offer the, to the American Negro the American dream, literally the American dream. Uh, Sidney Dones actually moves to an up and coming middle class, actually upper class community called Watts. Watts is one of the first integrated neighborhoods or cities actually in the country. It is one third Latino, one third black, one third white by 1940 and it was considered the model of the future. Things happen and I'll talk a little bit later on in a subsequent lecture about what happened to Watts, but Watts held out the promise. It was advertised in all the Eastern papers as one of the best suburbs, one of the best suburbs in the country for, Afri uh, for African Americans. Yet there was a problem. There were restricted covenants all over California. Yes, blacks had the opportunity to own homes, but only along Central Avenue, only in the Central District. 90% of Los Angeles was literally off, off limits. And as one person said, we were encircled by invisible walls of steel. The whites surrounded us and made it impossible for us to go beyond those walls. Black folks would fight against those walls. Black folks would fight against the restricted covenants. And the, that, that, that battle would continue through the rest of the 1930s, and I would argue it would continue well into the 1960s and the 1970s in Los Angeles and in Seattle. And we're going to talk about that battle in both places in a subsequent lecture. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll end at this point. <laughs>